All right, good morning. Are uh, we good? Uh, my name is Jim, one of the pastors here. Good to have you. Uh, we have Daniel chapter 2, about uh, 100 verses. So uh, we've got a lot to cover. I don't have much by way of uh, introduction because of that. Uh, we started the book of Daniel last week, and we wanted to uh, we wanted to look at it through a political lens. We wanted to look at it through uh, a sort of political perspective that we might learn some things in the current season that we're in uh, as a country, as a church. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at it through that kind of lens, and there's a lot to cover. Uh, we said last week when we started that the book of Daniel for us is going to be it's going to be helping us stay chill amidst the political fires. Right? How do we how do we not lose our mind uh, in the midst of the the, the political and culture? Uh, wars. And so last week we saw that God's people, they're in exile. Uh, Daniel is writing this because they're the cultural minority, they're the political minority, and he wants to encourage them. And we just said this last week, if you weren't here, this is what we said. We, the, the New Testament teaches that Christians, uh, we are also in exile. Uh, that, that the New Testament teaches that we should see ourselves as strangers in a foreign land, that we should see ourselves as the weird ones, that we're the cultural minority, that we are in exile. We are citizens of heaven on earth, and so this is meant to encourage and instruct us as well. It's comforting, right? This was written uh, to God's people in the Old Testament, but it's also written for us in our help and instruction and encouragement as well. Uh, and so last week, we, we saw that God is the God of exiles, uh, that we can find comfort, that, that God, he is, he is over the exile, He is over the exiles, He protects us, guides us, loves us, and knows us. Today, the big idea is that God is the God of kingdoms. God is the, God is the God of, over every earthly kingdom, over every human kingdom. Uh, God is over every king, every ruler, every president, and every political party. He is the God of gods. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. Someone say amen. All right, that's good news. That's good news. Uh, and, and so we'll, we'll see what, what, what Daniel would have for us today. One, one quick thing before we get started, just so you know. Um, I am trying, I'm trying to set a political theology foundation for us, okay? So you have to give me a few weeks before you get mad at anything I say, okay? So I'm trying to set a foundation uh, for us, a political theology that we can, we, can, we can then build off of that political theology so you're not allowed to email me this week, okay? You can email me next week. I'll start saying some things maybe you don't like next week. But this week, I'm just laying foundations. And so there's something that you don't like that I said, that's too bad, okay? I'm still laying some foundation, uh, and you gotta give me a couple of weeks. Uh, we good with that? Is that a deal? Can we make that deal? Okay. All right, so in verse one, in verse one, we see Nebuchadnezzar, he's been having some dreams, right? He's been having some dreams, he's not sleeping. Uh, he, uh, the language is his spirit is troubled. Okay, this is just the second year of his reign, and he's having these bad dreams. His, he has a troubled spirit. He's only been in power a year or so, and he's the most powerful man in the world, and yet he has a troubled spirit. A troubled spirit. In verse 2, he calls all the wise men, the counselors, uh, you know, all the people around him that he thinks could help, and he demands uh, that they tell him his dream and what it means. Uh, which is interesting because the text doesn't make it clear whether he knows the dream that, you know, at all. Uh, did he forget the dream because it's a dream and we can't, you know, we kind of forget them? Or did he know the dream and he's just nervous that they're going to make up some interpretation if he doesn't, uh, you know, if he, if, if, he, if he was to share it with them? They're like, oh, the dream means this. And it's like, doesn't mean that. Uh, we, don't, we don't really know. All we know is that this dream has been haunting him. Whether he knows the dream, you know, he can, he can lay it out or not. Uh, it's been haunting him. He seems troubled. It seems important. And so in verse 10, of course, they tell him, we can't do that, right? We can't tell you what the dream was. We could probably, you know, uh, offer up some ideas of what it, what, what it might mean if you were to tell us, but there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, they say. And then in verse 11, I love this, they just like tee it up for a gospel preacher. In verse 11, they say, no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Uh, John chapter one, John chapter one, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, there is a greater God, there's a God of gods and a king of kings that does dwell with flesh. Um, but, but here, I just wanna point something out. Babylon is a lot like uh, America, right? We've said like Babylon in, in, in Daniel's time was an actual city, but in the New Testament time, it's symbolic for any city, any culture, any, 
and, and any sort of community that has set itself up against God and against God's people. And so it shouldn't be surprised, uh, surprising to us to find uh, Babylonian values in America. All right, so Babylon and America are, are not all that different. In Babylon, they were very, very spiritual. They believed in, in a lot of gods. Uh, you could believe in, 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 in God, just don't tell me that your God is stronger than my God, that your God is bigger than my God, that your God is better than my God. In America, we see the same thing too. And so you, you need to know this, like every politician, every presidential candidate is going to say they believe in God, okay? They're going to tell you that, and they might and they probably do, okay? Every presidential candidate is going to do that. America is very spiritual. It would be political suicide to not do that. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy was running for uh, a Republican, you know, uh, uh, in the Republican primary. He's Hindu, and he like went to great lengths to try to like connect his Hinduism with Christianity because we're a primary, you know, uh, Christian uh, uh, nation. And so he's just like, you know, this is what that means. And, and, and I believe in God too. Hindus, of course, believe in, in, in hundreds of gods. Every political candidate is going to try to connect their spirituality, their religion to you. Uh, president Biden is, of course, Catholic. He's the only, he's only the second Catholic president ever. Anyone know the first? Anyone under 40 know the first? <laughs> JFK, yeah, JFK. Um, and yet he's gone against much of what the Catholic, would, uh, Catholic uh, teaching uh, would say in regards to culture issues, abortion, transgenderism, things like that. Uh, Trump claims to be a Christian. Kamala Harris claims to be a Christian. Uh, of course, we don't know their hearts. Only God genuinely knows their, uh, their faith and, 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 and whether it's true or not. Though Jesus said we can trust, uh, we, can, we can judge a man by his fruits, right? It, we judge a tree by its fruits. Uh, and so it, it, it doesn't seem, you know, like they're, they're following hard after Jesus. But, but everyone is spiritual. Every politician is going to claim some sort of faith or belief uh, in, in some sort of God. Right? We are a spiritual people that's going to come out of us. And so Nebi, in verse 15, I call him Nebi, by the way. Nebi is furious that no one can tell him his dream. And so he decrees that all the wise men in Babylon be destroyed. I love that. Like, that's his response, you know. As powerful as Nebi is, he's just an insecure child lost in the darkness of his dreams. Right? The most powerful man in the world. And he flies off the handle. He's erratic, he's paranoid. Uh, this is the, the mark of earthly kings. Every earthly king is the same way, narcissistic, erratic, paranoid, insecure, troubled, anxious, and sleepless. That is the earthly king. I mean, I know we have a celebrity culture, we love fame, we love power, but look at, look at, the, look at, look at rulers, look at them. Um, think about King Saul in the Old Testament, uh, Israel's first king, King Saul, unbelievably insecure and paranoid. Uh, Saddam Hussein back in the day, Gaddafi in Libya, right now Kim Jong-un or in North Korea, Putin. These are erratic, narcissistic, paranoid, insecure rulers, and we see this in the U.S. as well. Uh, every time a politician in the United States uh, just changes their policy uh, and completely like flip-flops on what they once said, and now they say this, all they're doing is catering to us as voters for more power. That is an insecure, lack of conviction, uh, will cave in to whatever it is that you want that they might have their position of power. These are earthly kings. Well, how does Daniel respond to Nebi's insecure rage? <laughs> in verse 14, Daniel, he speaks to the captain of the guard who's coming to kill him with prudence and discretion, right? Remember, he's a teenager. Daniel's a teenager with his... His boys, Shadrad, Meshad, right? Uh, he's a teenager. Uh, in chapter one, God had given him wisdom. And so with wisdom, with prudence and discretion, he responds literally in the face of death, he's chill. Okay, Daniel, teenager, he's chill in the face of death and responds in wisdom. In verse 16, he requests time with the king. He doesn't know the dream yet. He doesn't know what the dream was but he just requests time with the king. He's confident God's gonna give it to him. And then I love verse 17. He goes to his boys and shares it with them. Hey, let's pray together. I'm not gonna do this on my own. He has this community of faith uh, to, uh, to join with him in this prayer. And so then in verse 19, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Does God still give visions? Does he still give dreams in, in these kinds of ways? Do we believe that? At the paradox, we do, okay? We believe that. 
Um, and so God reveals the dream to him. And I love Daniel's response. Look at how, how God-centered everything is. Verse 22, he starts singing, right? Uh, verse 22, he says, uh, God, you reveal deep and hidden things. You know what is in the darkness. The, d- the light dwells with you. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and, I've made, uh, and have now made known to me what, I, what we asked of you for you have made known to us the king's matter. Right? It's very God-centered, his response. He's, he recognizes, Daniel recognizes that everything that, that he knows now is from God, that God has shown this to him and so now Daniel can respond. This is right theology, God-centered prayer, and worship, and Daniel, he's going to speak truth to power to, to King Nebi without any sort of pretense, right? It, it's not like I, it's not this arrogance, I know more than you, us versus them kind of posture. Daniel doesn't have an us versus them kind of posture. He's right, but he's not, he's not self-righteous. There's a difference because he recognizes that his rightness comes from God. And so he has confidence to speak truth to power, but it's in humility because he's received this from God. This is from God. This is not just because he's awesome. This is because God is awesome. And so he speaks truth to power without any sort of pretense. There's no posturing. He's not seeking power himself. He doesn't pontificate. It's just this God-centered, God-glorifying response. I I love what Sinclair Ferguson says. I I have a lot of Sinclair Ferguson for you. Uh, He's a a, a witty Scot and a great theologian. Uh, He says, this is the spirit of Jesus before the high priest and Pilate. This is the spirit of Elijah before Jezebel. It is the spirit of John the Baptist before Herod. Daniel is full of the spirit of truth. It was one said of Thomas Hooker, the New England Puritan, that when he preached, he seemed to grow in size until you would have thought he could have picked up a king and put him in his pocket. I like that. Yeah. And so here's my point. We can do this. We can do this. Remember last week we said it's God who gives, right? God, all of last week was just God gives, God gives, God gives. God's over all of it. One of the things that we said God can give us is his Holy Spirit that we might have the mind of Christ, that we might have wisdom in the face of chaos, that we might have uh, chill in the face of crazy, that he will give us wisdom. If Daniel, teenage Daniel, can stand like this before the king, surely we can stand before our neighbor, Surely we can stand or sit at the dinner table before our in-laws. Surely we can stand before our professors, our coworkers, and speak God-centered truth with a a humble boldness. Can't we? Yeah, a spirit-filled mother at a school board meeting can change the world. A spirit-filled student can respectfully contradict a pastor and start a revival on campus. By the spirit, with courage and wisdom, we can speak up and speak truth. Even, listen, like even if you never get a chance to have that kind of moment where you're speaking to uh, authority uh, in, in, in respectful, you know, in a respectful way, you speak truth to power. Uh, Even if you never have that, that opportunity, um, uh, you never know what your faithful witness will produce in the kingdom of God. I know some of you, you're nervous about even entering into these conversations about political or cultural issues. Um, and I just want to encourage you in this. Like, e- even your faithful witness in those moments, even if it's just with, uh, again, a coworker, a, a, a classmate, a, a neighbor, a friend, uh, you, you never know what that can produce. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he um, was a, a pastor in Nazi Germany. Uh, he, he wrote a bunch of books, two of them we still read today The Cost of Discipleship and Life Together. Uh, He was one of the few pastors in Germany to not cater to Hitler and the Third Reich. Uh, Most caved in, pledged allegiance, uh, and and Bonhoeffer didn't. In fact, he started an underground seminary, and he he famously told a friend uh, who was visiting the seminary, hey, we're doing this seminary, and and what what we're doing here has to be stronger stronger than Hitler's army. Like, the formation we're doing of the students here has to be stronger than the formation of Hitler's army. We have to raise up a generation of Christians who are, are stronger than the Third Reich. And, and it sounds absurd. <laughs> it sounds absurd that this little underground seminary, he would think, would somehow be stronger than Hitler's army. 
Uh, how could that possibly be? In fact, the Gestapo closed the seminary after just two years. Listen to this. Uh, half of Bonhoeffer's students would cave and sign allegiance to Hitler. Uh, others would be arrested for the resistance, and Bonhoeffer was martyred. He was killed. Uh, and so it seemed like Hitler won, right? And yet, Hitler was defeated. That little seminary that produced maybe 50 to 60 pastors produced a community so strong that today we, fall, we talk about the fall of the Third Reich and the rise of the church. Yeah, so even, even just our little bit of faithful witness can produce uh, immense fruit in the kingdom of God. And so teenage Daniel, he stands before the king boldly speaking truth. We can do that. We can do that. No, he tells him the dream, right? So look at verse 31. Tells him the dream. Everybody gets caught up on the dream. The dream's cool. It's a good thing to get caught up on. Verse 31, he says, you saw, O king, a great image, a statue. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partially of iron and partially of clay. And as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand. Underline stone, circle stone, highlight stone. The stone is everything. And it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay. It broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, and all together were broken in pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing uh, floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. I love this. Love this image, okay? If you remember back in Revelation last year, imagery, it's meant to stir in you something. It's meant, meant to make you feel something before you try to figure it all out, okay? That's what imagery is meant to do. So he begins to interpret the dream. In verse 36, he says, now I'll tell you the interpretation. Verse 37, you, O, o king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given. Okay, there's the same language of chapter one. God has given you the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, okay? Uh, second part of verse 38, you are the head of gold, right? He says, you're the head of gold, so he's interpreting it. King Nebuchadnezzar, you and your kingdom in Babylon, you're the head of gold. Verse 39, the silver kingdom is less valuable than the gold kingdom. It's inferior. This is probably the Persian kingdom that comes and uh, takes over the Babylonians. Then, of course, there's a bronze kingdom, even less uh, valuable, even more inferior. These are probably the Greeks. Alexander the Great conquered the Persians. And then you have the iron kingdom in verses 4, uh, 40 through 43. This is most likely Rome. How important is it for us to know that stuff? Not that important. Not that important. The big idea is that they represent earthly human kingdoms. That's what the statue is representing. But then in verse 44, a great stone will break in pieces all of these kingdoms and the kingdom of, uh, and the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will not end, okay? So let me point out three things from the dream, okay? Three things from the dream uh, that, I, uh, that, that, that we can observe. Uh, first, um, the world is without excuse, okay? Here's something that you couldn't possibly know by looking at an English translation uh, of this text, but... Uh, what every commentator that writes on Daniel points out is that chapter one is written in Hebrew, but then chapter two, beginning in verse four, it's written in Aramaic. And it goes all the way to chapter seven, then it switches back to Hebrew, okay? Now, there's a, a number of reasons why people posit that is the case. Like, why, why, would, why would Daniel write uh, all of a sudden in Aramaic? Here, here's the predominant theory, and I think it's right. Uh, the big idea is that Aramaic was the, at the time, was kind of the world language, okay? Most of the nations, most of the peoples, they spoke in Aramaic. It's kind of like God, the Holy Spirit, who's inspiring Daniel to write these words, uh, wanted to make sure the whole world knew this part. He wanted to make sure the whole world knew. Like, the way I thought about it is Daniel loses his southern accent, and the Spirit tells him to start speaking in a Midwest diction, just to make sure everybody understands that the God of heavens is going to set up a kingdom that will not end and that every other kingdom will fall. Just wanna make sure the whole world knows this, okay? And so the world is without excuse. To quote Romans 1, what can be known about God is plain to them. 
To quote Revelation 11, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Don't miss this, right? Everybody in the world, every nation, every kingdom, every ruler to come, don't miss this. Uh, but you will fall, and Jesus will rise, and his kingdom will never end. Okay, that's the first one. The world is without excuse. Two, um, this is monumentally important if we're laying a foundation for a political theology, okay? Two, God's kingdom is real, and it's really political, okay? God's kingdom is real, and it's really political. Uh, if you look back at verse 44, verse 44, uh, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. Do you see that, like, this is not metaphor. I think sometimes we think about, like, New Testament language, we think about, oh, Jesus is talking about the kingdom, and it's kind of like metaphor. It's not like a real kingdom. No, it's a real kingdom. Daniel's putting up all these other kingdoms, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, next to God and his kingdom, and God crushes those kingdoms, and only God's kingdom will remain. Like, they're, they're, they're both political kingdoms. God's kingdom is real, and it's really political. Okay, the political nature and reality of Jesus and his kingdom is not metaphorical, but actual. Jesus was a political figure. Do you understand that? Jesus was a political figure. He didn't run for political office. He wasn't partisan. There wasn't that back then in Rome. He, but he was a political figure. He died a political death. He was crucified by the Roman government. He was put up, uh, conspired against by the Jewish rulers. He, was a, he died a political death. Uh, he, did not, he was not crucified for doing miracles. He was not crucified for teaching. He was not crucified for being a pretty dang good guy. He was crucified for fear of revolution. All right, his followers, many of them, they thought the Messiah equaled a military king. It, the, the way in which the, the Jewish people interpreted the Old Testament promise of a Messiah was that this Messiah would be a political king, which he is, just not in the way that they thought he would. Uh, just not in the way that they thought he would be. And so there was a revolution, an uprising. There was, the, there was stirring about, and so both the Romans and the Jewish rulers were nervous, and Jesus, he dies a political death. Jesus, he says, I'm bringing this kingdom, and it's a kingdom that uh, theologians call uh, is already, like it's here, but it's not yet fully here, uh, which, by the way, is part of the stone then growing into a mountain, okay? Jesus said the, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's little, it's small, but then it grows. And so the kingdom is here, but it's not fully here yet. And in the same way, in the New Testament, the local church then is this political entity. We are an ambassadors. We are, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, we are ambassadors, Right, so a local church is like an embassy of God's kingdom, where we're the presence of the kingdom of God in a, in a foreign land. We're the embassy of God's people. I'll talk more later in the series about even some of our policies. Right? We have political policies and how we act as a church. Uh, we, we have immigration policy in this church. Okay? We have uh, a way in which we think about abortion and women's rights and different things like that. It's all based on what God would tell us to do, and we act on that. We think about the poor. We think about, we have those kind of policies here in the ministry and mission that we do as an embassy of God's kingdom. And so it's really weird then when Christians begin to seek political power in earthly kingdoms. Okay? I don't mean political position. I think we should, as Christians, run for office, uh, try to serve in those kind of ways. But I mean, as a, a voting block, we would seek any sort of political power. We already have it. We already have authority. We already have power. We're already a part of a kingdom. And it's going to be the only kingdom that lasts. We already have it. Now, like Jesus' first followers, we have to realize that his kingdom and his politics may not be like we first thought. Uh, the Old Testament, if you read it, God's people, they wanted a king, and they wanted a king, quote, like other nations, okay? And it went really bad for them. If you read 1 Kings and 2 Kings, uh, it's a litany of bad kings, okay? A royal mess, uh, just struggle bus, okay? 
And so whenever God's people are seeking political power, whenever God's people are seeking cultural power, whenever God's people are wanting to have the power that, you know, the earthly kingdoms have, and we don't recognize and realize the power of the heavenly kingdom we already do have, that's when we start to move astray. Okay, tracking? Are we tracking? Okay. Now, when we say Christ is Lord, this is a real political statement. When we say Christ is Lord, we are declaring our allegiance already to a political ruler and we need not have any other. That is a political statement. Christ is Lord. Third, okay, third thing we can kind of gather from the interpretation of this dream. uh, Earthly political institutions are subject to God's moral judgments too. Let me say that again. Earthly political institutions are subject to God's moral judgments too they don't get a pass, okay? They don't get a pass. So back in verse 35, um, maybe you thought of this language. In verse 35, the stone, it strikes all the other kingdoms, right? Uh, Breaks it to pieces and then became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. For those of you that know your Psalms, did that remind you of any particular Psalm? Anyone? Psalm chapter one. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seats of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree, a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Listen, earthly human institutions will fall if they walk away from the way of God. They will not stand. St. Clair Ferguson, again, he says, This is so monumentally important. The key to understanding the rise and fall of empires and emperors is not military or financial, but rather moral and spiritual. The destruction of these great kingdoms is not an accident of history, but instead the outworking of the judgment of God on kingdoms that have turned from his laws and forsaken his word. Come on. This means that every human institution will fall. Government will fall. The church will fall. Marriage will fall. Any, anything God has instituted, it's going to fall if it forsakes God's moral and spiritual ways, even if it looks successful on the outside. You track with that? Like that's, it might look good, but if it's begun to and has, be, has been moving from God and God's ways, then it's going to go down. A church can be successful in the American church kind of way, but if they are not teaching the Bible, if they are as a people moving away from the ways in which God would, would have them be, then it might look good on the outside and people are there for a while, but watch out. Jesus has his hands on the light switch and the lampstand is going away. I don't, I don't care how big a church looks or how good it looks, right? It's going down. On the outside, a marriage can look good, but hidden sin is like a crack in the foundation. It will fall. And the same thing with government. It can, be, it can be a successful government for centuries, but fall in one generation if it forsakes God and his ways. And we only have to look at history to tell us that that's true. It's just true. Now, can I just say this? It's inevitable. All right, it's inevitable. Listen, I, you guys will hate this. I, you, you, you're gonna hate this, but it's just true, okay? I love America. America one day will fall. Like in terms of its power, it's just, it, it's inevitable. It will. Only the kingdom of God is forever. This is inevitable. When you have earthly rulers and human kingdoms, they will fall away and it will fall. It's just a reality. Only Jesus is a perfect king and only Jesus can rule a perfect kingdom. That's why, that's where our hope is. Okay, now here's the king's response to Daniel, okay? Verse, 36, uh, verse 46, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, paid homage to Daniel, okay? Commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. 
The king answered, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you, have been unable to re for you have been able to reveal this mystery, verse 48. Then the king gave high honors to Daniel and many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king, appointed Shad, Meshad, Benny, over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained at the king's court. Two quick things, and then I want to talk about some application. Uh, two quick things here. One, this looks like Nebi repents and worships the one true God, um, but just hold on, wait till next week, okay? He didn't, okay, he didn't. Um, but there, there is something here, like you can be impressed with God, you can be impressed with spiritual power, you, you, can, you can recognize something about God and not actually submit your life to him and actually love him. And, and some of you are here today, and here's what I would just say, like, God is, he's, he's not a genie in a bottle. He, he's, not a, he's not a strong man on stage that, you know, rips, you know, does weird strength things. He's not someone to awe at in terms of, like, oh, he's, you know, he's the man upstairs. <laughs> you submit your whole life to him, and you love him because he first loved you. I mean, there, there's a way in which we can know about God and then there's a way in which we know God. There's a way in which we can acknowledge the existence of God and there's actually having a relationship with him. But then two, Daniel gets promoted here, right? That's the response of the king. He promotes Daniel, he honors him. It goes well for him here. But I just want you to remember, this is descriptive, not prescriptive. That may not happen to you. You might speak truth to power and lose your job. You might be dishonored, not honored. You might fall, not, not, not succeed. It may go bad for you if, you're, if you do this. If you're faithful and you say the right thing and you do the right things, it doesn't mean you will receive honor from earthly authorities. It, it may happen like Daniel, it may not. In fact, if you look uh, again across history, you might actually lose some of your power and influence. You might actually have an ax to your neck if you do this. The point is being faithful, not what you might receive, okay? All right. Now, in terms of application, how might we think about all of these things? Let me offer uh, uh, three, three observations, three, three ways of application for us. Um, here, here's the first one. Go to the next slide. Um, being non-anxious is better than losing our minds, okay? So you can't email me on this, that's just true. You know this, uh, of course it is, right? We're talking about how do we stay chill uh, in this political, season, how do we stay chill uh, in the midst of the political and cultural fires? Uh, I've seen 20-year-olds and 70-year-olds lose their minds over this stuff and not stay chill, okay? Now, one way we can stay chill is we can disengage, okay? We can sort of distance ourselves from the whole conversation. Now, for some of you, that might actually be a first step of obedience, and maybe you need to kind of step out of some of it uh, and, and turn off some of the social media and just kind of check out for a little bit. But, but, but for most of us, probably not. We might, we might not need to do that. We might not should do that. Uh, there might be a time, right? Daniel doesn't do that. Uh, of course, he can't because you know, he's going to die if he doesn't engage in this moment, okay? Um, but we probably have to step in. We just have to step in non-anxious, not losing our minds. And so Daniel, he, he, his, his situation is far more existential than us, but he's a teenager and he speaks with prudence and discretion in verse 14. And then there's two things that, that in, our, in our text that I think we can learn from how he is non-anxious. How is he non-anxious in this moment? I think two things. One, first, in verse 17, he has embedded himself in community. Okay, he goes to his, I love the language, companions. Uh, companions. Uh, it's a Latin word, come, with, panis, is bread, with bread, right? So these are, these are his boys that he breaks bread with. Like, this is his people. This is his community. These are his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Like, these are his boys. He's in Community, his true biblical community. One author says, anxiety thrives in isolation. If you want more stress, spend more time alone, disconnected from others. The non-anxious person has deep relationships with Christians who listen and pray with them when life feels overwhelming. They remind one another of God's reign and encourage one another to stay calm and faithful. 
right? And so he's non-anxious because he's got some boys that he can, he can talk with and kind of, you know, he doesn't have to go online. He just, he's just got actual community. But then two, he also prays and listens to God's voice. Or he prays and he actually listens to God's voice and just kind of waits. Man, what does God's word say? What is God's spirit telling me? What dreams and visions has he given to me? Uh, you know, just, he, he's just waiting to hear from God as he prays. Why? Because in verse 22, he reveals deep and hidden things. God is the one who knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. He recognizes that, that God is the source of wisdom. God is the source of wisdom. And so he prays and he listens to God's voice. Um, second thing that we can go to, go to the next one, um, that we can observe. Uh, go to the, I, I'm gonna skip that one, boss. It's a great verse. Go to Psalm 31, 131, but I'm skipping it. The, the uh, yeah, there it is. God's wisdom is greater than man's wisdom. Did you notice that in the text? Right, I mean, that's, that's one of the, the great themes uh, of this is Babylon's wise men couldn't do what Daniel could. Right, all these guys come, and come forth and, and none of them could do what Daniel could do. Verse 10, again, there is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. All right, but Daniel, in his prayer of thanks to God, in verse 23, says, God, you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. And so I wonder, I wonder if in political and cultural matters, as you think about them, Right? As you do engage and you begin to think about the political and cultural issues and, and the wars and the conversations, I wonder if you've actually asked God to direct you and guide you and to give you wisdom in how you should think about those things. Or, or do you just you know, uh, spout the party line and the talking points of your political party or your tribe? Have you actually learned from God how to think about those things or do you learn from TikTok how to think about those things? Because God's wisdom is greater than man's wisdom. Have you done that? Write down five, four, three issues that, man, you just kind of see or you've wrestled with or you're not sure how you've come to believe what you believe about those things or think about those things. Write them down and ask God for wisdom in those. What might it look like to receive God's wisdom and not man's wisdom. Here, here's my encouragement to us in this. Let's not be theologically or intellectually lazy. Let's not be theologically or intellectually lazy. Let's grow up. Let's seek to be godly. Let's be uniquely Christian this fall as we think about these matters, but God's wisdom is greater than the wisdom of man. Here's the last one. Uh, the last one is this. The God of nations, uh, the God of the nations is greater than the kings of men. Uh, this is the verse, I believe, of chapter two, my favorite one anyways. Uh, in verse 21, Daniel's responding in prayer and worship to God, and he says, he changes times and seasons, he removes kings and sets up kings. That is utterly profound. That is astonishing. God, you are the one who sets up kings and removes kings. You set up rulers and remove rulers. You set up presidents and remove presidents. God, you do this. You do this. Remember verse 37, uh, when, when he's interpreting to the king, he says, you, O king, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom and power. God has given you this. He has set you up and he will take you down. God has done this. God has given you authority. This, by the way, is all throughout the scriptures, this reality and this truth. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. Uh, or John 19, Jesus before Pilate, right? The governor, he, uh, the Roman governor, Jesus uh, is standing before him. Pilate says to him, you will, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? How did Jesus respond? You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. <laughs> Heck yeah. Yeah. Or Revelation 1, 5. This letter, this prophecy, John writes, is from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. Yeah. But the most powerful image in the dream, or the most powerful part of the dream was what? It was the stone, the stone. 
Yeah, a stone that struck the statue and broke it to pieces. And then in verse 35, it, it grows. It becomes a, a great mountain that fills the earth. Dude, who's, who's the stone? Right, Jesus, the great cornerstone. Right, the cornerstone. That's Jesus. Jesus, he quotes Daniel chapter 2 uh, in Matthew 21. Here's what he says. He says, therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Okay, do you see that? Moral and spiritual ways of God, the, the, those are the only sorts of institutions and people that will stand. Verse 44, and the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Right, and so Jesus is this stone, comes flying into the Roman kingdom, knocks it down, changes the world, and then this stone grows into this mountain, the kingdom of God. It starts small like a mustard seed, but it grows into the biggest tree, right? It's this large mountain that will eventually fill the earth. And so the kingdom of God, it doesn't seek power. It is power. It is power. Again, Sinclair Ferguson, he says, God fulfills his purposes in the world in space and time. It's a reality of a, it's a real political kingdom. His kingdom is not established in an otherworldly, mystical way, but through the lives of men and women and flesh and blood here and now. It comes into being in the world in the context of the rise and fall of empires in the midst of good days and bad, good rulers and evil kings. And so Daniel, this faithful teenager, stands in the king's presence, boldly proclaims a kingdom that's coming and will never end. In a similar way, an angel shows up a few hundred years later into a podunk town called Nazareth and comes to a teenage girl named Mary and tells her, tells her uh, that she's going to have a baby. Luke 1, verse 31, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And so how should we think about these things and feel about this? What if politics, as one writer puts it, is really about longing in the world? Try to connect like what you see out there with what's happening in your own heart and desires. What if our desires for political things, cultural things, what if it's actually revealing a longing that we have in our heart? And we're not really sure what to do with it. And so just because we're human and sinful and, and, made, and made for great things, and beautiful things, and mighty things, and eternal things. Our heart longs for some things that we don't have. And so politics, it's, it's maybe our longing in the world that something is missing and we're looking for something to help it, something to feel it. And so I was just thinking about this, like what if, what if right now you took a moment to take stock in your political heart the way in which you think about these things. And instead of fretting about what might happen, you let it expose in you that longing, whatever that longing is, that desire, whatever that desire is, that fear, maybe, whatever that fear is. Let it expose something in you. Maybe it's a sin. Maybe it's an idol. Sure. But here's my encouragement, go a little bit deeper. Maybe it's just a longing for the kingdom of God. What, what if our, what if our um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, our political disappointments. Right? What if our, our disappointment in culture and what it's doing and where it's going, what if that's just a longing in our heart for the kingdom of God and that's actually meant to stir us to worship and prayer spirit-filled good deeds, spirit-filled truth to proclaim? 
And the enemy, the enemy, he doesn't want that, and so he, he, wants, you, he wants you disengaged from all of that, or he wants you obsessed. Boom, now you're out of the game. Now you're out of the game. One more ambassador of the kingdom of God, out of the game now. Because there's something we want, and we're not recognizing that that longing is meant to direct our desires and our hopes and our, our worship and our prayers and, our, and all of that to a great king who will not fail, who will not fall. In fact, he is the stone that will strike every other human ruler that has failed you, abused you, hurt you, disappointed you, and he will crush him. And his kingdom will continue to rise and one day will fill the whole earth. Praise be to God. And so try to connect some of the stuff that's happening out here with some of the stuff that's happening in here and see if we can turn that attention to God. And so let's come before him even now. We've got plenty of practical things to talk about, plenty of things to worry about, plenty of things to chat about policies, politicians, all that kind of stuff. But we gotta lay this foundation that just says, God is the God of all kingdoms. Every kingdom will fall. Let me grab that. Every kingdom will fall, but Jesus' kingdom will remain. And so, Father, just ask by your spirit right now, you are the one who gives wisdom. Uh, you are the one who reveals. You reveal what is hidden. And so what is hidden in our hearts? What sort of longings and desires do we have and maybe we've been looking to earthly rulers, people in power, people in authority, um, the famous, the connected, the wealthy. We've been vying for cultural or political power in some sort of way. when actually you're just wanting to speak to that part of our heart and bring healing there, be generous in that place to give us something. And so God, I just pray that you'd speak to your children now. Give us wisdom and understanding. Stir in us worship for you, O oh Lord. Pray this in your powerful, mighty, and able name, Jesus. Amen. Love y'all. Come on, let's keep going.